it's just the words are too small uh, when you watch it. So it's entirely for that reason. And uh, if we had a way to, you know, lower it down from the ceiling, we wouldn't keep it up here on the stage. But, you know, we're, we're not there. We're good. Let's advance that slide. Very good. Well, welcome to Holy Week, as some people call it. And uh, uh, I've chosen not to speak about the triumphal entry, which is the Sunday before the resurrection. Uh, since we don't do a not having a Good Friday service, I'm going to talk about um, the crucifixion. And so the question is, what's so good about Good Friday? Because the crucifixion was horrifying and holy at the same time. And we call it Good Friday uh, because of an ancient definition of good or holy. Uh, holy. So it's, it's, it's a holy, powerful experience that was happening. In fact, I think it was the best Friday ever, and, uh, and, and be not because of what happened to Christ, but why he endured the cross for you and me and what it brings about uh, for the one who places their faith in him. Christ's crucifixion, let me say this, Christ's crucifixion without his resurrection is just another tragic execution. Without that resurrection, which we'll talk more about next Sunday, <clears throat> uh, we would have never even heard of Jesus. There would be no Christianity. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our faith is useless. There's nothing of value to it just another religion. So speaking of next week, it's Easter and I hope you'll join us uh, not only on Sunday but on Saturday for the Easter maze. Don't forget to sign up for that. So if you joined us on Facebook, we're doing an amazing Easter maze on uh, Saturday afternoon. Go to our Facebook or uh, our you can go to our Facebook page and register or you can go to faithoutpostchurch.org uh, and register for that for your time slot because there are half hour time slots when people will arrive and go through the egg, uh, go through the maze. Kids will go home with uh, a great uh, an account uh, of the resurrection of Christ and Easter eggs. So uh, we promise you that kids may be more interested in the egg part of it. I don't know. So anyway, that's next Saturday and Sunday. There's a sign up in our foyer to help out with setup and uh, with helping out through the day in, in, in kind of uh, shifts on Saturday. So, back to Good Friday, back to the best Friday ever. I want to talk to you today really about the, uh, two things, uh, the, the fact of Christ's crucifixion, and then the force of his crucifixion. And, and what I'm going to share with you uh, comes from a sermon that was preached on the day of Pentecost from a guy who just about 50 days prior denied that he even knew Christ. Nope, never knew him. Weren't you one of his disciples? Nope, not me. And then he swore that he never knew the man. And then the rooster crowed. Of course, that's Peter. And then something amazing happened, the resurrection, and then Peter is standing in a, in a crowd of several thousand people and proclaiming the resurrection of Christ uh, from the dead. So Peter went from saying, this would never happen, you know, when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, Matthew 16, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be turned over to the hands of sinful people, and I'm going to die, and the third day I'm going to rise from the dead. And, and Peter said, no, no, Jesus, this will never happen to you. This will, no, Jesus, that's not the way it's going down. That's not our plan for your life, Jesus. And it's not our plan for our life with you either, Jesus. You ever make your own plans apart from God? Anyway, Peter had those, and uh, he said it would never happen. And he went from proclaiming that it would never happen to proclaiming that it was the best thing that could ever happen for us. So if you look, if you want to open your copy of Scripture uh, to Acts chapter 2, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time in that, and we're going to uh, look through this passage of Scripture. So the first thing I want you to know about the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ is that it was preordained. It was preordained. Look at this. This is in Acts chapter 2. Peter uh, says, fellow Israelites, uh, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. In other words, he's, he's calling, he's saying, look, this was not done in secret. 
Many of you have seen or know somebody who has seen one of these signs or wonders. Many of you know people that were healed. Some of you might remember Lazarus who was raised from the dead. So he's just calling on things that they knew and uh, had seen and had experienced and, and talking about Jesus. And then he says, this man, the humanity of Jesus, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. So let's think for a moment about God's deliberate plan, preordained, determined in advance. I'm going to look at some scriptures in a moment, but the second point I want to make to you is it was predicted, not in the sense of a guess, Every, we try to predict, how many of y'all filled out a March Madness bracket? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like way below 30% accuracy on mine. Uh, I did have Ohio State and Michigan in the final just because I thought it would be cool. Uh, Michigan might make it, but Ohio State definitely isn't. <laughs> and, you know, that's a prediction. But this is not, I'm not talking about that kind of prediction, not that kind of a guess. Think of it more as prophesied, prophesied. God's prophecy is God telling in advance what's going to happen. It's not predicting what might happen. It's telling in advance what's going to happen. And so that's how you can think of, uh, of prophecy. And for example, look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 through 10. This is one of the, the key passages of Scripture from Isaiah, uh, which, by the way, was written about 700 years before the time of Christ. I'll share with you some information uh, about that in, in, in a moment, but I want to look at this first. Isaiah 53, 5 through 10, listen to this. Verse 5 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced, nails piercing uh, his arms and his feet. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So he's talking about, you know, the fact of it, and this is what happened, but he's also getting into the meaning behind it. He's getting into what was going on behind the scenes. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? <laughs> For he was cut off from the land of the living to death. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though... Uh, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, it was the Lord's will for Jesus to die. A horrifying, painful death. You might have seen in the news there is some more Dead Sea Scrolls that have been found in the Cave of Horrors. That sounds like something right out of Aladdin, you know, the Cave of Horrors. In, in the Middle East, of course, back in the 40s, uh, the story goes, a Bedouin found, threw a rock into a cave and heard something shatter. And uh, they went into the cave and they began this discovery of ancient documents from a community known as Qum Qumran. And amongst those findings was a complete scroll of Isaiah. Isaiah. And that scroll dates from 200 B.C which is fascinating on a couple of levels. Number one, uh, it happened before the time of Christ. Number two, and this is, this is kind of a side note here, but I find equally fascinating, prior to that discovery, the, the oldest scroll uh, that we had of Isaiah dated from 1000 A.D. So if you've ever wondered, and I've heard people say this, how do we know that what uh, Paul wrote or what Isaiah wrote is what we have today because it's been copied and, you know, people make errors and copies. And here's what they're able to do. From the scroll that we had in 1000 AD, comparing it to the scrolls that we found that date from 200 BC, no differences. Maybe a, a spelling difference here and there, but no 
difference whatsoever. So it gives us reasonable confidence that what was written has been transmitted uh, down through the ages accurately. So anyway, just that side note there. So anyway, um, Isaiah was not written after the crucifixion of Christ. Therefore, you like making it, okay, let's, let's make it look like this was predicted ahead of time. It was prophesied ahead of time. And uh, we have a scroll that dates from at least 200 years prior to uh, the death of Christ. So it was predicted, prophesied. It was also, it was perfectly described. I already mentioned that he was pierced for our transgressions. In verse 9 of Isaiah 53, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Now, usually in people's minds, uh, especially of that day, if you were wealthy, you were blessed. You, if you were wealthy, you were blessed. You weren't wicked. If, you, if, if God blessed you with wealth, it wasn't because you, know, you were wicked. So that was kind of a common understanding. But now look at this. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Now how can that be? When a, when a person was crucified, <clears throat> their body would be taken outside uh, the city and dumped in, in, a, in a dump. They, they were not deserving of being buried. And that's what would have happened to Jesus had not two rich men intervened on his behalf. Joseph and Nicodemus came and asked for the body of Jesus and gave Jesus a tomb. He was put in a borrowed tomb. Of course, he only needed it for uh, uh, three days. But anyway, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. The earliest known crucifixion was around 500 B.C. Many cultures have a used crucifixion as a means of execution. And that date, 500 B.C., is significant um, because man, I just, my mind just went brain. It's like, it's some timer's disease, folks. I should have, should have made a note right there of that. So anyway, we're talking about uh, it being precisely carried out. I'm going to go back to that. I hate it when that happens. Uh, anyway. Yeah, but not up here. Okay, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I appreciate your grace there and your, your, your mercy there. I'll get teased about it later. I have some in this room that will make sure of that. I'm just, I'm, anyway. So it was precisely carried out. It was precisely carried out. Listen to what John, John, uh, that last living disciple. We talked about him a little bit last week. Listen to what he wrote in John chapter 19, verses 35 through 37. The man who saw it, uh, talking about himself, talking in a third person. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. Look, John is saying, I'm an eyewitness. I know what I'm talking about. I saw it. I was there. I saw him die, and I saw him alive later on on that Sunday evening. I saw him. I know what I'm talking about. He tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. So John's saying, I'm sharing this with you so that you can come to believe. I want you to believe the same thing I did. And, and, and Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So even if you've never seen the resurrected Christ, there is still a power that will convince you that it is true. And you can come to have that same faith that John had. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. So John is tying it back to the old, what we call the Old Testament scriptures, not one of his bones would be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Now in terms of the, the no bones being broken, uh, from Exodus 12, 46 and Numbers 9, 12, uh, the Passover lamb, and Jesus is called our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Those references in Exodus and Numbers particularly say the Passover lamb from the Jewish annual celebration, not one of its bones would be broken. 
So however the nails pierced his, his hands, and in that day a hand would go from uh, the tip of your, your longest finger to your elbow, kind of like measuring a horse, a hand, you know, any, anyway. So the, the nails would probably have had to go through here to not break a bone and probably would have had to go, this is interesting, through his heels so as to not break a bone. Not typically the way we see it portrayed uh, through his feet because that would have broken a bone. Not one of his bones was broken, and that is the fulfillment of prophecy. And then from, uh, he said, well, look on him whom, whom they have pierced. And Zechariah 12.10 uh, from the Old Testament says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. They will look on the one they have pierced. And so John was tying the events of that day on the, of the crucifixion and, and then ultimately the resurrection to things that had been written, prophesied. And that's one of the things that gives us great confidence. God, this was not something that just spontaneously happened in the first century. It was something God had deliberately planned and moved heaven and earth to carry out, and, and then to give us the track record of the prophecies ahead of time so that when it happened, we would know this is exactly what God said was going to happen. Look at the confidence that God is giving us in Scripture and in the events of those days so that we would know this was not just something that was made up. Not only was it precisely carried out, but it was recorded put down by historians. Now, why do I say that? Of course, I, I believe that the uh, New Testament accounts are uh, historical, but outside of the New Testament, outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those guys writing it down and recording it for us, uh, you may wonder, uh, is there any references to Jesus in the resurrection from other non-biblical sources? You ever wonder that? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely. It's true. One of them is from a guy by the name of Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian, and we have uh, today copies of his uh, antiquities, 12 volumes. He wrote about Roman history and Jewish history, and, and he contained a lot. In one of those antiquities, um, this is what he wrote. At this time, there was a wise man named Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Now, Josephus is not saying, I have come to believe that myself. He's just recording what he knew to be reported. And so that's one. There's, um, and then, then there's another one from Antiquities. Having such a character, Ananias thought that with the Festus dead and Albinus still on the way, he would have the proper uh, opportunity. Uh, convening the judges of the Sanhedrin, now the, the Ananias and Festus and Albinus, those are uh, Roman governors, uh, if you will. And he brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called the Christ, whose name was James. In other words, there was a point in time where James was put on trial and uh, this, this Sanhedrin was convened and, and James is identified as the brother of Christ. Uh, there, there's another one from Tacitus, who is a uh, Roman historian. Uh, it's rather lengthy. I'm just give you a piece of it. It's a, and this is, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite torture on a class hated for their abominations. Now he's referring to Christians. Uh, and he says, called Christians by the populace. Christus, Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition. So what Tacitus is calling a mischievous superstition is the resurrection from the dead. So a mischievous superstition uh, was checked for the moment and again broke out, not only in Judea, uh, the first source of the evil, this 
superstition that Christ had risen from the dead. It's interesting. There's a uh, you know a very non-believing but a historian writing that down. Um, but even in in Rome, and 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 there's more, and you can look those up. You can't believe everything you read on the internet, but you can read uh, believe some things, and you can read those texts that have been translated into in English. So it was put down by historians. It was recorded. And so there is no credible scholar today that would say there was never a man by the name of Jesus that existed, that that was all made up. There's just too much historical evidence, including scripture and other outside sources. Uh, there's evidence that he was crucified. It's recorded in outside sources other than the Bible. And of course, those sources just reference a supposed re resurrection, but then there is the New Testament and there's several references uh, historically to his uh, resurrection and we'll get into more of that next week. But I want to talk about not only the fact of Christ's crucifixion but the force of it. The force of it. There was a power that was unleashed on that day. It was a power not to destroy. When we think of the most powerful things that we know we would think of nuclear weapons. We would think of volcanoes erupting. We're thinking of destruction. There was a power that was unleashed on that day to restore, to rebuild, to renew, when to arrest death, to stop death in its tracks. The force of the resurrection. That's why Christians have written and sung songs about it. And I'll promise not to try to break out in song when I just quote some of these. Would you be free from the burden of sin? What's the next line? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Of course, referring to the crucifixion of Christ. Or, what, or, or this one. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Or this one, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, now listen to this, not in part, but the whole. Not some of my sin, all of my sin. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Can't you just hear the melody in your mind? Is, and you're thanking me for not singing it. Is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. There's something amazingly powerful that brings life, that gives life, that restores lives, that brings eternal life. Something powerful was unleashed on that day. Um, and it was once for all. Once for all. Parents, have you ever said to your kids, once and for all, that's it. That's it. It's, it's final. It's the final word. I am not going to say this again. I want you to know the matter has been decided. We're going to look at a scripture on that in a moment. Uh, but it, it goes with this. Uh, it was once for all. Never needs to happen again. Never needs to ever happen again. It was once for all. It was powerful enough, powerful enough for every person that ever lived previously. And I think of, you know, we think, how, how do people in the Old Testament, how, well, what was salvation like for them? Well, it was still by faith. We know that from Genesis 15, 6. And I look at it like it was faith in a deposit that was going to be made in an account later. And God said, that's good enough. If you have faith, that deposit on your behalf is going to happen later on. And the faith that people since that time have is looking back at that deposit that has been made in that account on our behalf. And it was powerful enough to cover every person that had ever lived or will ever live on planet earth. To wash away every sin. Not that it does because it's based upon a faith response, right? But it's powerful enough to do that. There was a force that was unleashed that takes away our sin. Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. This is what it says. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all, there's that once for all, at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. Now notice, it was once for all, but it doesn't take away the sins of all. Because it's that faith response. It takes away the sin of all who come to him in faith, and that's why he stated that to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, a second time. Jesus is coming back, folks. Jesus is coming back. And it's not going to be anything like his first coming. He's not going to be born in a manger. He's going to ride on a white stallion. He's going to come victoriously. It's going to be a completely different uh, scene. But he's going to appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. He's going to bring it all to its final uh, consummation. Uh, Colossians 2. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins. Having can I love this, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Now here, here's, here's, what I, here's what I love to think about when I, it's, it's like there is a, a legal document that has my name on it, and it says, these are the crimes, these are the sins, these are the failures, every one that Jeff Houghton has ever committed. And by the way, since God has some foreknowledge, every one he ever will. Every one. The charges of my legal indebtedness. How would you like to receive at the end of your driving career the videotapes in the Tickets for every time you rolled through a stop sign, ran a red light, went over the speed limit, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then say, this is what you owe. Pay up. Now, I I share that just to say, kind of, and that, that pales in comparison. But there's this charge of legal indebtedness. All of my sin which was hostile to me. In other words, it's not doing me a favor. It speaks of condemnation. It speaks of judgment. It speaks of wrath. It speaks of what I deserve. And God takes that out of the way because it was nailed to the cross. The punishment that brought me peace fell on him. He bore my punishment for my sin in his body on that tree. And God is able through that, and it's the only way that he's able to do it is through the cross of Jesus Christ. He takes away our sin. And that power is still in effect today. It's a power that puts things right with God. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin, there's that sinlessness of Christ, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. I heard Billy Graham say many, 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 many years ago that on the cross Jesus became the most sinful man that ever lived. Not his own sin, but the combined sin of every sinner on planet earth. He became an offering for our sin, the punishment, not just for me, but for all of us, for all humanity. The punishment that brings peace to the heart of a person was laid on him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Now, righteous just means God made everything right. God made everything right between me and him. Things were wrong between me and him because of my, that legal charge of my indebtedness to him. 
Those are all the ways that God said, Jeff, I want you to. And I said, no way, I'm going to do this. Jeff, I don't want you to, but no, I'm going to do this anyway. All, you know, God, God, all, all that was hostile to me. That's the, uh, the condemnation that I deserved. But Jesus has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And thus, it makes me in a right relationship with God. Makes me in a right relationship with God. Those who place their trust in Jesus um, puts us right with God. And I love this as well. Fourthly, it cleanses our conscience. Cleanses our conscience. I know lots of people through the years that wish their conscience could be cleansed, washed, scrubbed. We have tile in our kitchen and dining room. Terry has this scrubber that cleanses it, washes it to make it clean, to remove the dirt, to remove the stain. Which is another way of saying forgiveness. But I, I love the, the terminology here, cleanses. It's deep cleaning. It's deep cleaning. There is no stain that it cannot clean. There is no guilt that it cannot remove. There's no sin that cannot be forgiven. There is no person who has to live with a guilty conscience. And it's not because <laughs> all of a sudden we decided to start living right. That doesn't cleanse the conscience. It's not good deeds. It's not offering money. It's not any other means. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It cleanses our conscience. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? I've known lots of people who want try to serve God with a guilty conscience. You know, it doesn't work. It's frustrating. Outwardly, they may be going through the motions, but inwardly, it's kind of like I'm trying to buy God off, pay him off. It's like I'm trying to ward off the hitman, you know, the mafia hitman that's coming after me and I better pay up or he's going to uh, lower the boom on me. We don't have to live with the stain of our guilt and our failures in our life. God wants to wash it completely clean. He doesn't remove it from our memory but I tell you what, once he forgives us, the memory of it fades. It'll never go completely away. You can always recall it if you must. But the guilt is gone. I love Psalm 32, 1 that says, Blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. So in other words, when I remember that sin, I could say, Yep, I did that, but praise Jesus. Praise Jesus through his cross. I am forgiven. I am forgiven, and I don't have to live with the guilt and the shame of that because it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, if you trust anything else to cleanse your conscience, it will not work. So many people try good work. So many people try religion. So many people try addictions, perfection. So many people try so many other means. And there's one that's free, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's the one that works. The force that was unleashed. I'll talk to you about one more thing before we're done. And it's the faith that appropriates. The faith that appropriates. To appropriate means to take something for one's own use. And so faith, our faith in Jesus, appropriates what he accomplished on our behalf. Acts 2, 37 through 39, when the people heard this, I mean, I would encourage you to read Acts chapter 2. We're just kind of looking at a couple of things from it, but uh, Peter uh, stands boldly and proclaims. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? I'm sure there were some in the crowd that were saying, you're nuts. 
You're crazy. But there was a significant number, we find out later, 3,000 people. 3,000 people responded positively to that message on that day. Peter replied, repent, repent, and then be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. I love what, how Andy Stanley has outlined this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to give it to you real quick. God sent him. You killed him. God raised him. You better say you're sorry. God sent him. You killed him. God raised him. Better say you're sorry. Repent. The word repent means change your mind. Think differently. Change your mind about Christ. Change your mind about the resurrection. Change your mind about the way you live your life. Repent. Repent. Change your mind. Uh, On the next chapter of Acts, chapter 3, Peter again says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah, the Christ, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Repent. Now, I've got to thinking about that because... There's a lot of different terminology that's used in Scripture. Here, it's repent. Repent. Sometimes in John 3.16, for example, it says, Whoever would believe, whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus' favorite term as he was walking through the countryside and around the lakes and, and throughout Galilee, he would say, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. And they really all mean the same thing. In fact, I created this powerful diagram here. It took me hours to create this. But I want you to see it. Because wherever you enter this circle, wherever you enter, let's say you start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus. I'm going to start following Jesus. Well, you know what that's going to lead to? Faith. It's going to lead to faith. If you truly follow Jesus, he's going to lead you in the pathways of faith. Or let's say you enter uh, in the terms of faith. You were in vacation Bible school. You were uh, in Sunday school. You were at a revival meeting. You were at church. You, you heard the gospel, and, and, and you heard John 3.16, for whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And you placed your faith in Jesus. Or... Somebody preached a message for me when I got saved uh, in 1976. It was uh, the word slave, which I, I didn't translate it as repent at the time, but it really was. Turn your life over to Jesus. Turn your life around. And it included believing in him and trusting him, knowing that he died and that he rose from the dead. But it, it, it led to following him and believing in him in a growing faith. So wherever you enter, Whether it's whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. I could have put that up here, but I didn't. There's lots of different phrases that are used. Uh, Repent and be converted. Be converted. A conversion. A Christian conversion experience. You're entering this experience. And following Jesus doesn't end with just merely reading about his life and hearing messages about his life. Believing in him is not just, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, and then living your life any old way you want to live your life. Repenting is not just turning your life around. In the true biblical sense of repentance, it's beginning to follow Jesus and trusting in him. And I, I, wanted, I wanted to give you that because Peter, at the end of that sermon, said, repent and be baptized. He was not tying baptism to the conversion experience, but it was a, a sequence of events. Repent, and then as evidence of that, be baptized. And on that day, 3,000 people were added to the church because they called upon the name of the Lord. So what's so good about Good Friday? (laughs) What's so good about Good Friday? Uh, I think John 3.16 summarizes it. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Just put your name there. For God so loved. Put your name there. For God so loved. God loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting I've got a couple of questions that we call keep the conversation going, and here they are. Do you still carry the guilt of past failures? Do you still carry the guilt of past failures? You know, you don't have to. Second question, what are you hoping will finally remove all of your guilt from past failures? Now, there's a checklist here that I provided for you. Are you hoping that time will do it? Are you hoping that punishment, feeling bad long enough, or whenever anything bad happens, you you think God must be punishing me for my sin? Addictions? Addictions are very often a means of trying to over silence the guilty conscience death finally when I die the guilty conscience won't ring how about the cross of Christ what are you what are you hoping what are you hoping I mean in all honesty that requires you know gut level honesty if you're a Christian you know that the right answer is always Jesus But in your heart of hearts, listen, if your conscience, if you are already, I'm speaking to followers of Christ now, if you're already a follower of Christ and your conscience isn't completely cleansed, it's because you're trusting something else to do it. And nothing else. God, what can we say? What can we say other than thank you? We are humbled. This takes away all boasting, all pride. There's nothing, God, that we have to offer you that's given in exchange for forgiveness or eternal life. What you want from us is our faith our trust, our belief. And I'm grateful that you've given us so many reasons to believe, to trust, to know it's true. And God, I would pray for any who have heard this message either in person or on Facebook live or will listen to it later on YouTube. God, that something would just speak to them in their hearts. And they'll be like the 3,000 that on that day when Peter gave that invitation, that they said yes and invited Christ into their life. God, I pray for that to happen. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as we come into this last song. It's a time of invitation, of prayer. I'll be over here to pray with anyone that would like to pray. You can just sing along. You can quietly contemplate whatever God might be saying to you, but I invite you uh, to give your response.